So we begin the book of Deuteronomy tonight. It's not necessarily a book of news stories, but it, Deuteronomy literally means second law or second telling, and we get a recap of some of the, you know, the greatest hits from the previous books. It reiterates laws and stories because some are just worth being repeated. Now, the last time that I gave a drosh from the Bema, it was in early June, and it was a report back from my last trip to Israel, which was a, just a, four, a short 48 hours on the ground solidarity mission with UJA taken just a few days after the ceasefire. At that time, Israelis were feeling shattered and were deeply despairing. And they spoke about how close they felt to change in Israel, and yet how in that moment it looked like it was impossible. I came back from that trip and I struggled not to despair myself. But I get to do a second telling because I went back to Israel for my Hartman study and for a family wedding. And I have to say that the country feels remarkably different just one month later. So I'd like to share a few snapshots, three in particular, literally with a few pictures because, you know, it's like, let me tell you about my trip to Israel. But I feel like the, the picture sh shares a lot. And these are not necessarily the big stories that are going to be written in the paper, but they are stories of Israelis that you and I love and know. So it feels important. These are people who are connected to Central Synagogue, and they help us know that change is coming in Israel. So the first person is Eli Waldman Kaplan. Eli is a Jewish Israeli artist, theater director, and set designer. Oh yeah, we weren't gonna show the picture yet, but that's okay, you can leave him up there. <clears throat> he created Central's portable arc, if you recall that, that we got last year, which made us all feel very connected to each other and to our sanctuary when we were all virtual last high holidays. Eli is gay and traditionally observant, and he speaks and dresses in a way that communicates both of those quite openly. Now, if you don't know, Tel Aviv is considered the gay capital of the Middle East. And I asked Eli, as a single gay man, why he didn't live in Tel Aviv. Here, I might take that down for just a minute because, I'm, because I kind of was, I was waiting for the punchline, but that's okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so I asked him why he didn't live in Tel Aviv. And he said, when I walk around in Tel Aviv, they're all completely comfortable with the fact that I'm gay. But since I wear a kippah, people look at me like I'm a freak. They don't understand how I could also be religious. This has something to do with the very strong religious secular divide in Israel and the minimal non-orthodox options that are there. But in Jerusalem, Eli has found a small traditional shul that welcomes him and he has even become their gabbai, which is an honored position of being a Torah service leader. Now, a few years ago, a woman at the synagogue told their synagogue community that she had decided that even though she had not found a life partner, she wanted to be a mother. So she was planning to have a baby on her own. And Eli was friendly with her. He knew she was a brilliant scientist, but he didn't actually know her all that well. But he too had always wanted a child. He took a leap and asked her, would you want to create a very different family model where she would not have to do this all by herself, where they could co-parent a child that was theirs and all the responsibilities and supporting that that was, that was required? So now you can see why that gave away the punchline. But anyway, now you can put Ellie up with, this is Ellie with their daughter, Verid. She is now almost a year and a half old and she is the happiest child. And Eli found an apartment a block away from her mother, and Verid splits time evenly between her two parents' homes. But this modern family of three comes together every week. Where else? At synagogue, where it all began. And there, the entire shul treats her like she's their baby, and Verid runs around the place like she's the mayor. And I thought, wow, things are changing in Israel. Don't put up the picture yet of the next one. Okay. <laughs> I had a chance to spend time with our dear former cantorial intern, Shani Ben-Or, 
who I think we maybe officially made the announcement that she is coming back to help lead our high holidays this year. Yeah, which is very exciting. Um, next November, Shani will be ordained um, from the Hebrew Union College's rabbinical program, which has ordained over 100 Israeli reform rabbis serving in congregations around the country. We have Rabbi Yoshi Zweibach here, who actually used to be, um, I think, the dean of that school. Is that right, Yoshi? Something like that. Okay. <laughs> he was uh, helped in the, in the ordination of many of those rabbis. Um, Shani will be ordained not only as a rabbi, however, she will also be the very first Israeli reform cantor ordained in the country. And Central, we feel so proud that while she studied here in New York at HUC's Cantorial School, she interned with us, and we are a part of this historical first for Israel. Now, becoming the first of something is not easy, and there are not models of cantors as true clergy in, in a lot of reform synagogues in Israel, especially women. Orthodox schools often have knowledgeable lay leaders who lead services, and in more liberal places that are known for their music, they often hire professional singers who are not trained with all the background of what it is to be a clergy person. So Shani's going to have to forge a new path. And I saw a glimpse of what this might look like when I attended a special Kabbalat service she led at the Tachana Rishona, which is the first train station in Jerusalem. If you have not been to Israel in over a decade, in the last decade, you should know that the renovation of this train station, think of it as like a Jerusalem High Line, it has transformed the city. And along these first train tracks, they built up restaurants and shops and a beautiful biking and running path that goes on for miles and a cultural center right in the middle of it all which hosts events regularly. And while much of Jerusalem often feels like it's still segregated with the religious neighborhoods here and the secular neighborhoods here and the Arab neighborhoods here, at the first train station, they are all together, mixing, walking, eating together. So now I'll show the picture. This is, on Friday nights, on the main stage, a different group every week hosts Kabbalat Shabbat for the city, and it was my good fortune that my first Shabbat in Jerusalem, Shani, was leading. Imagine the scene. It's a huge outdoor hub with tent coverings, housing a bustle of restaurants, bars, and shops, and smack in the middle of it all is this stage, and Shani is up there with Boaz, her musical partner, and two other musicians, and hundreds of people came, and they truly represent a mix of Jerusalem, including people who wear head coverings, totally secular Israelis in shorts, tourists, the Jew who would never be caught dead in shul but is curious, and a number of beautiful children who dance around in the front like fans at a rock concert. Shani led music, she taught Torah, she made the group laugh and sing, and she helped all of us bring in the Sabbath bride to this unlikely place in this most unlikely gathering in a way that felt so Israeli and perfect and hopeful. And I thought, things are really changing in Israel. And lastly, I had the good fortune of spending time with Rabbi Gilad Kariv, who is the first reform rabbi to be elected to the Knesset. Gilad was the head of the Israeli Movement for Progressive Judaism, which IMPJ, which is the reform movement in Israel. He was their leader for over a decade. Now, it might seem strange to us Americans that a reform rabbi would run for Knesset, but he came to understand that the most effective way that he could advance religious pluralism and values of equality and fairness and justice in a country that does not separate religion and state was through politics. So Gilad was the fourth in line in the Labor Party, which is now part of the most wildly diverse, unprecedented, audaciously hopeful co coalition in Israeli history. In this unity government, we have Yamina, which literally means, in Hebrew, right, which is not an extremist party, but as the name suggests, it's a party which definitely defines itself as being right-wing, and Meretz, which is currently the most left-wing Israeli party, which was almost left for dead, but somehow was recently revived, and for the first time ever, you also have an Islamist Arab party, Ra'am, led by a religious pragmatist, Mansour Abbas. People have been skeptical that this coalition could last, 
They count the days and now weeks that it's still around, like the way people talk about a newborn baby. Yes, the coalition is four weeks and five days old. <laughs> I'd like to show you this picture of me visiting Gilad at the Knesset in his new office. And I will say that Gilad at first wanted to be appointed the Minister of Diaspora Affairs. And that would have been a very natural fit for him because he cares about Jews around the world and he understands the stakes. But the head of labor, Mirav Michaeli, said, I'm not giving any minister positions to any freshman Knesset members. You have to learn the ropes first. But she knew the talented Kariv, who was also trained as a lawyer, would be very effective. So she gave him an incredibly powerful position as chair of the Laws and Constitution Committee. This is me with him in his big conference room. That's his conference room just for the laws and uh, Constitution. He insisted that I sit in his chair for the picture. Now, every single law that gets passed through the Knesset goes through his committee. And even better, through this role, this reform rabbi is now responsible for appointing all the religious judges in the religious courts. Imagine that. Now, the Haredi rabbis are so mad of course, they refuse to call him rabbi, but they won't even call him by his name. They call him Ish Hazeh, that man. <laughs> but that's democracy at work. Now, I was at the Knesset the day before the inauguration of the new president, Bougie Herzog. There was an air of pomp and circumstance with lots of Israeli soldiers, horses, singers, and an air of true possibility and hopefulness. So yes, it's still too early to tell what this new government will bring. As I said, it's only four weeks and five days old. It's hard to know how my anecdotes of these three beloved Israelis to our central community are really harbingers of changing views of Jewish families and different forms of Jewish pluralism that can take root in Israel. And yet, it's clear that in my second scouting, recent scouting trip to the land, that I can say that things are indeed changing in Israel.